In this episode, we are going to reimagine the parasite from David Fincher's The Killer. The Killer is an absolute masterpiece of visual storytelling. It is an excellent subject to analyze, explore, and to learn for filmmakers and those interested in cinematography. In the first act of the movie, Finch and his team combine two sets and a real location in post. They also added typical artifacts like horizontal flares and distortions to give the killer an anamorphic vibe. To make this more interesting, we are going to do it for real. One real location and of course using real anamorphic lenses. We even developed a way to film through a real rifle scope. Anamorphic of course. This was possible as DZO Film introduced three new focal lengths for their Pablo lineup of anamorphic lenses a 135mm and a 180mm, as well as a 65mm macro that were essential for this project. We take you behind the scenes and share our experiences with you and of course show you the results that is our short The Killers that gives the story a new spin. Hello and welcome to another episode in the Media Division. Happy to see you around. I am a long-term fan of David Finch's work all the way back to his music video times. And for me, Fight Club is one of the best movies of all time. Fincher has a very unique approach to visual storytelling that makes his films instantly recognizable. Most everything he has done can be used as a masterclass for filmmakers. And that's what we're going to do today by reimagining the parasite of The Killer. Spoiler warning, if you haven't seen The Killer, but you are planning to do so, this episode will give away some crucial events important to the story. You have been warned. We are going to recreate or more accurately reimagine the climax of the first act, giving the story our own spin to keep it interesting for those who know the original. We analyze and use The Killer as inspiration under fair use for the education of filmmakers. We strongly believe that things like this nurture the cultural relevance of a movie far beyond its initial release and introduce it to a new audience. It is thanks to Netflix that this movie exists and it definitely deserves some love for that. If you haven't seen The Killer, head over to Netflix and watch it. It's titles like this that make Netflix worth the subscription. The killer is really a journey into the mind of the protagonist, the killer himself. David Fincher once stated that he liked characters who don't change, who don't learn from their mistakes. And I think the killer is a great example for just that. What makes us invested into the story is not the character arc, but the experiences we share with the protagonist. One is born, lives their life, and eventually one dies. His monologues gives us insights into his occupation and his techniques. We share his boredom. We learn about his set of rules, his attempts of moral justification, and we share his panic. The audience is the killer, who has no other real name. To draw the audience into the head of the killer, Fincher uses a set of techniques. First and foremost, something that I would describe as a trademark technique. He locks the camera to the protagonist. His movements translate into the movements of the camera. This can be very subtle at times and works a bit like subliminal messaging. His movements are your movements. Your brain reacts by assuming you are him. Fincher is also known for shooting a larger image to be able to crop and reframe in post. This allows for extremely subtle moves. This explains why Fincher has a long history with RED as they offered 4K Cinecams long before Ari did allowing to reframe the image with less obvious quality loss. This also explains why Fincher doesn't like to work with anamorphic lenses as the optical quality of anamorphic images doesn't allow for significant crops. In The Killer, Fincher and his Academy Award winning DOP Eric Messerschmidt use camera movement in brilliant ways. No movement really happens without a reason. While The Killer is getting ready for the hit, the camera is very static representing the mental state of focus and structure. Almost all shots are done from a tripod. When the hit goes wrong, the Fuck. camera immediately breaks loose to underline a feel of panic and uncertainty. 
Another very important method to drag the audience into the mind of the killer is the sound design. The sound is subjective. You hear what the killer hears. This includes how sound is perceived in different situations. What is the killer focused on? Is he concentrated? Is his mind wandering or is he half asleep causing a dreamlike quality? Ren Kleist did an absolute fantastic job of creating a soundscape that is never obvious but so important for creating a bond between the killer and us. When the killer puts in earphones you can hear them brushing against the skin and you can hear how they mute the room sound. A focus tool. And this is when the Smiths iconic How Soon Is Now takes over and dominates the rhythm of the evolving story. Loud and present when we see what the killer sees and whispering earphones when we take a third person view. When we look through the eyes of the killer, we never hear him speak. We only hear him speak when we're looking at him. At this range, a subsonic rounds drop is not an issue. Subjectivity is established with a vertical sound edit, meaning that the cuts are hard, just like the image instead of flowing with a horizontal transitional edit. Stick to your plan. Paris. The look and feel of the location sets the tone for the whole movie. While the location of the first hit is real, there is a surprising amount of CG that helps to achieve the desired result. These effects are extremely well done and largely invisible to an unsuspecting viewer. These amazing VFX breakdowns are from the Art Temple showreel. I'll put a link to the full version in the corner and in the description. Thank you for your support, Art Temple. The architecture of Old Paris didn't provide the large windows that were vital for telling the story. The solution was to combine shots of an existing location with two sets on sound stages. So what you see in the final results are many layers of real shots and some CG elements. Two windows were combined and enlarged to work as a main stage for the sniper hit. The window glass and elements of the facade like the railings were added in post. The real location was the Place L'Estrapade in the 5th arrondissement of Paris, fittingly named after an ancient torture method. As you can see, it is indeed directly next to the Pantheon. We are very lucky to have some agent in Paris that filmed some impressions of the location. This is the building with the target's penthouse on top. Opposing the penthouse is the hideout of the killer. Considering a viewing angle from slightly above the target's apartment and by counting the floors in the staircase scenes, we can assume the crew used one of these windows. As they are quite small, the crew had to come up with a crowded setup of cameras pointing to different parts of the scenery. This setup filmed the actions on the streets below as well as plates of the target's building and apartment. About everything of the Place L'Estrapade itself is quite real. Here's the bench the killer has his breakfast on and hilariously it disappeared. I wonder if someone has a new garden bench somewhere. This is the fountain the mother and her kid played on. And this is the entrance to number 23, the target's building. The copy shop next to the entrance still has the same window dressing that it had in the movie. Thank you Matthias and Valentin for defying the rain and taking us to the original film location in Paris. It is wonderful to have people like you around. Links to their Instagram pages are in the description. The interior of the target's apartment were not shot on location, but on a soundstage. To give those scenes a realistic look, the set had to be as far from the camera as it would be on location. Only this will provide the right compression of perspective. Eric Messerschmidt is on record stating that the distance was 200 feet or 60 meters. But measuring the distance in Google Maps, it seems to be more like 130 feet or 40 meters. This distance also fits the lens that was used to film the actions on the target side. A Fujinon T2.8 75-400 zoom lens and that is quite a monster of a lens costing close to $100,000. Here you can really see its size when it's viewed in relation to Tim Jordan of Lee McFilm and Digital, an Australian rental house that kindly provided the photos of the Fujinon. Thanks Tim. Later, the shots of that set were combined with plates shot and location in Paris. The killer's hideout was a soundstage set too. This method of layering allows for total freedom of timing, framing and sizing in the final edit. An interesting approach described by Eric Messerschmidt is that the lighting of the night sequences of the hideout was done just with practicals. 
all lights used are visible in the set. There's the working light and the windows that have been lit using LED panels. A lot of scenes in the killer show an expressive anamorphic look, but the Zoomilux C that were used are spherical lenses. Anamorphic characteristics were added in post. Combat veterans call this tunnel vision. Everything becomes a blur. I call it anamorphic. The killer's main cam was a red V-Raptor that has a large format sensor. Interestingly, the Summilux are designed for a Super 35 size sensor, but cover considerably more. Fincher and Messerschmitt could decide on how much bumper they wanted outside of the frame for stabilization or destabilization in post-production. Real anamorphic lenses were not suitable for the close and intimate shots in the killer and as described earlier, anamorphic lenses are not ideal when a lot of cropping and reframing is planned. The solution was to add anamorphic characteristics like horizontal flares and heavy bell distortions in the wider shots in post. Admittedly, the results look very real and beautiful. Besides the horizontal flares and barrel distortions, Messerschmitt stated that they worked on the bokeh too, but I can't spot any over bokeh at all. But I promise, I'll find something fitting. And this is where the idea for this episode was born. How would the killer have looked if Fincher and Messerschmitt did use real anamorphic lenses? And while we are keeping it real on an optical level, for a lack of a large enough studio and resources to build a set, we had to do the whole shoot in one real location. For today, we are not going to go deeper into anamorphic lenses in general, what they were designed to do, their history, their characteristics, their up and down sides, and how you can shoot anamorphic even with limited resources, but we have the very detailed scope series of episodes that have all the information presented to you in the usual entertaining way with the fitting Blade Runner theme. If you're interested, there's a link in the corner. To be able to shoot a reimagined killer, we had to solve a couple of problems. Finding a suitable location surely being the hardest. We had to look for a handsome looking building with large windows, with a second building, opposing at the right distance and angle. Almost impossible. Especially with no budget. With a lot of luck and thanks to an old friendship, we were allowed to use the Italian consulate in our city. On top of that, the neighbors were super supportive, letting us use the apartment facing the consulate as the killer's hideout. The consulate is located in a romantic villa and the large windows are ideal for a shooting. Thanks to the support of the consul, we had access to all areas and we were able to stage a break-in. All weapons used in the film are prop guns, of course. We shot only on private property, but to make sure that no neighbors call for a SWAT, we informed the police about our activities. Better safe than sorry. Our actors are all amateurs. We have the mighty Morty from Morty Films himself taking on the role as a second killer. And the bodyguard is played by a neighbor. Thanks a lot, Wolf. For a short, we came up with a different story than the original and coined it The Killers. Plural, as we're going to tell the story from two perspectives. The first killer's perspective is in this episode and the second killer's perspective will be released on Morty's channel. Make sure to head over to Morty Films after this episode and to subscribe if you want to see when his take on the story comes out. There's a link in the corner. The Consul of Italy is played by the Consul of Italy. Mille grazie, Comandatore Tony. Naturally, all the sniper perspectives were shot from the opposite side of the road. Coincidentally, the distance between the hideout and the concert is 40 meters, so identical to the distance in the original. Unlike the original, we didn't use a separate set and green screens to combine our footage. Shots that show the consulate through the window are actually showing the consulate through the window. The hideout is a spacious apartment, but unfortunately it's not a loft, limiting the placement of the camera, the lights and lacking the depth behind the protagonist. 
We tried to work around these limitations as best as we could, but of course it will always look much different than the white scenes from the original. Our lighting concept was to go with the same approach as Messerschmitt, all practical. We got construction lamps looking somewhat similar to the ones used in the original and added some tubes to work as the ambient room lights. During filming, we soon found out that the architecture of the hideout didn't allow for lighting the protagonist just with a practical construction lamp. Narrow doorways simply blocked the light, we compensated by setting up extra rim and eye lights. We really would have loved to have the open space of the original hideout. More about the hideout set and specific shots later, as we will go into our most important gear choice for this project first. The lenses. We needed anamorphic lenses that have the right set of specs. We used the DZO film Pavo 2X anamorphic lenses that are designed for Super 35 sensors. If you are a regular watcher of this channel, you might have seen our review episode of the DZO Pavo. I'll put a link in the corner. The Pavo are relatively affordable and deliver very high image quality. They also deliver on other requirements like high speed for the shallow depth of field and an overall great close focus performance. Not to mention their small and light design that helps a lot with small productions. For a review, we had the 28mm, the 40mm and the 75mm focal length. A core set that will be sufficient for most narrative work, but the killers would not have been possible without additional focal lengths. Recently, DZO released exactly what we needed. There are two new telefocal lengths in form of a 135mm and a 180mm that will give us a lot of the reach we need. And a 65mm macro, a 2x magnification lens with an extremely short minimum focus distance. The new focal lengths are significantly longer and heavier compared to the other lenses, still even the 180mm is slimmer and lighter than this 40mm Atlas Orion. They do retain the 95mm barrel size for a streamlined workflow. All Pavo lengths are available in blue and neutral flare version. We are using the neutral version. 28mm, 32mm, 40mm, 55mm, 65mm, 75mm, 100mm, 135mm and 180mm. That is a really complete set that will be able to handle about any situation you might throw at them. The Pavo lineup is quite unique in the market of affordable anamorphic, where sets are often limited to the very few important focal lengths. The 65mm macro is pretty unique. There are only very few anamorphic lenses in the market that have the close focus and magnification capability of the 65 macro. With our initial tests for the killers, we were really impressed with the performance and how close we could get even trying it with the DJI Focus Pro for a ridiculous macro out of focus. Just to make it clear, the Focus Pro is not intended for this kind of use and we had to pull some tricks to make this work, like putting the LiDAR unit right in front of the lens and dialing in a wrong installation distance, still it kinda works. If you are interested in the DJI Focus Pro, we have a whole episode about it. Focus of the future. Check it out, link is in the corner. One thing that is very obvious about the macro is the heavy breathing, especially in the close focus range, something that seems technically very hard to avoid considering the long traveling distance of the lens elements. This would be a reason not to use the 65mm macro instead of the 75mm for long ranges as that one has very little breathing. But generally, we really fell in love with the macro as it opens up a whole world of possibilities that are hard to pull off with anamorphic. This lens will allow us to get all the awesome super close-ups you see in the original, but anamorphic of course. Like all Pavo focal lengths, the 65mm macro is designed for Super 35 format. If you take a complete 3x2 full frame open gate image, you can see exactly where the lens vignettes. And as you can see, you can use the full height of full frame if you desire a taller aspect ratio. For example, you can cover 16x9 using the full height of full frame. The neutral version of the 65 doesn't flare easily or expressively, but with the right source it does look beautiful. The falloff is very pleasant and the image quality is very good. 
The strong breathing and the barrel distortions make the 65 macro more suitable for the macro realm, but in a pinch you can absolutely use it for wide shots too. While we edit, let's have a quick look at the coverage, distortions, breathing and the flaring of the new tele lenses. The 135mm covers full frame in 6x5, recording for widescreen aspect handsomely. And at the width is designed for, it easily covers 16x9, making it very versatile in terms of format for reframing or multi-aspect shooting. As it is a relatively long focal length, distortions are minimal. Again, we see little but beautiful flaring. On the 180, coverage looks very similar. You can cover full frame 6x5 with a little bit of vignetting and at the width it's designed for, you can cover 16x9. And you do have a little wiggle room for reframing. Bokeh is gigantic. The focus fall off renders nicely and as to be expected, we have next to no distortions and the flaring falls right into the lineup. Of course you noticed by now that the talkies of this episode were shot with a 135 and 180mm. The relative distance to the subject make them very suitable for portrait work and help your subject to look the best it can. The tele shots are essential to tell the story of the sniper hit. Our anamorphic 100mm, 135mm and 180mm gave us a good range for filming the target's house, but for the tighter shots we needed something much longer. 400mm on Super 35 to match what Messerschmitt did. Something that the Pavo don't offer and that is very rare in anamorphic in general. As described earlier, the very long shots were filmed with a Fujinon 75-400 to zoom. Of course, a 100K lens is slightly out of our budget, so we had to do it with our Sigma 100-400 photo lens that is not parfocal and has a variable aperture. At 400mm, we have to deal with a maximum aperture of f6.3, which is really not ideal at night. Full disclaimer, we collaborated with DZO one more time to bring you this episode and to show you what the new 135mm, 180mm and the 65mm macro can do. A couple of months ago, we had early access to the prototypes and gave DZO a bit of feedback, hopefully helping with the development. We had free access to the whole range of Pavo lenses for this episode. We are not obligated to glorify the Pavo at all. I honestly like my set, but I let you judge the lenses by what you see. I was recently told by DZO that Panavision in France acquired a set, so I assume they like what they saw too. Thank you for all your support, DZO. It is very much appreciated. On any Oakley jobs, distance is the only advantage. For the killer, Messerschmitt shot the rifle scope sequences with an ordinary telelens. The insides of the barrel with its reflection, the distortions on the edges and the crosshair are added in post. The reason for this approach is that this will give a pristine image. But if you ever look through a rifle scope, you might agree that it also looks fake, simply because it looks way too good. As we planned to do everything real, we really wanted to find a way to shoot the rifle scope sequences with a real rifle scope. This would hopefully provide a more realistic and optically interesting image. My brother happens to be a marksman and he was so kind to provide a Schmidt and Bender scope with a 10x magnification. It is smaller, so presumably slower than the one in the movie, but the magnification seems to be similar. We came up with a mounting solution that would allow us to place the scope in front of an anamorphic lens and capture the projection of the scope itself. When we started testing using the macro, we couldn't have distant objects and the crosshair in focus at the same time. Something logical considering how optics work. Still, looking through the scope with the eye directly, will both have crosser and target in focus. The trick is to focus the taking lens to infinity and use the diopter of the scope to adjust focus. 
We ended up using the 55mm Pavo as a taking lens behind the scope. Now the crosshair is only slightly out of focus. Hey. We filmed most of the shots using our old Ari Alexa XTM. It still delivers a very high-end image and the uncompressed RAW gives fantastic headroom in the grade. While it is amazing that a 10-year-old sensor can hold up with modern designs, an old Alexa has a lot of practical shortcomings. The M has a detached head that makes it much easier to handle than a full-size Alexa. But the head needs to be tethered with a fiber cable to a large camera body quite similar to a normal Classic or XT. This is not the camera you want to run over a street with. Most importantly, the Alexa's LF3 is not a low-light hero. At 800 ISO, the image still looks great and brighter than any other camera I used with the same ISO rating, but if you try to make a dark scene much brighter by pumping up the ISO, the image falls apart. All hideout scenes are shot with the Alexa at the base 800 ISO. The wider shots of the consulate using the 100mm, 135mm and 180mm were shot on the Alexa with ISO 1600. In all shots where we needed high ISO performance because of the smaller patcher of the 100-400mm to zoom or with a rifle scope attachment, we used our Kinefinity Mavo LF Mark II that has great ISO performance. We had to pump the ISO up to 10,000 to get a usable brightness and it's to the marvelous glory that the results are still good enough to intercut with Alexa footage. Considering that the Marvel just got so much less light to work with, it's a really amazing performance. Even though we used real anamorphic lenses, we didn't force flaring by shooting light directly into the lenses. Just like in the original night sequences, flares are basically absent with rare exceptions. With all the planning, we couldn't avoid to use post effects in some of the sequences. Simply because planning things just didn't work out, crucial timing was impossible or it's the nature of the shot to be done in post. For example, our reflection in the window is a post effect, just like it is in the original. We borrowed the frame from the original too. To provide the clarity to see what is going on, the rifle scope shots with the background are also put together in post and of course the muzzle flash and the glass are not real. To let you know what is going on in the frame, we put information about the lens, camera and added VFX underneath the image. If you don't want to be distracted or you prefer to guess, we have a standalone version of the killers without that information. Link is in the corner and in the description. Let's watch what we were able to make out of the demanding circumstances with the killers. It is not a simple task to bend a powerful man to a will that is not his own. Powerful men are all about will. Money is not an incentive for a man that has enough money for many lives. Powerful men are rich. To band a man of will, you have to find what a man loves most and show him that you can take it away. A powerful man might tell you about their love for a flag, family, loyalty, but it's always themselves, their own petty lives. This is why powerful men get a lot of death threats. And a death threat doesn't frighten a man that is used to it. Discard decadence. I am, therefore I was not killed. It is not enough to show him that you can get to him. to show him that you have what it takes. Show him that you have the means. Killer. 
show him that you have the will. Show him that you don't give a fuck. Hey, and there it is, the perfect message. You have shown this man of will what will really is, and the powerful man is yours. Our little short ends here, but this is not the whole story. We did shoot the story from the viewpoint of the second killer inside the consulate. All that footage is shot on the Marvel F handheld with a 32mm Pavel, except for the pick close-ups. Morty will use this footage for an episode on his channel to tell the story of the second killer. What is the meaning of the pig? What was the last thing that went through his head? I mean, besides a bullet. I don't know, and I can't wait for Morty's spin on this. Head over to his channel, Morty Films, and subscribe to find out when that episode drops. Don't shoot the messenger? As you see, sometimes shooting the messenger is the best way to send a message. Did the killers look as good as the original? Of course not. No matter how good we are, we will not be as good as Fincher, Messerschmitt and a whole army of professionals on set and in post that had a multi-million budget to spend. Not to mention the acting skills of Michael Fassbender. To do Everything real will also give a lot of restrictions and technical hurdles to overcome. It is kind of the nature of this platform and this channel that our budget was much less than what the catering of a single lunch on the Killers production must have cost. Still, isn't it great that we are in a point in time where even the smallest budget allows us to do something that is able to hold a tiny candle against the highest end? Episodes like this are only possible thanks to the help of our beloved members, donors and partners. And I cannot thank them enough. Your generosity and passion helps us to create content designed for you and hopefully spark the fire of passion in the next generation of filmmakers. The Division salutes you. If you want to help us with our mission, you can become a member or you can give us a super thanks. If you are an industry hero or manufacturer that would like to partner with us, you will find our contact mail in the description. I would love to thank Morty for collaborating with the Media Division one more time. Mille grazie to my old friend the Commandatore Anton Resner for letting us use the consulate and for playing our target. A really solid performance. Thank you to Wolfram Wolf Lautner to give us an awesome bodyguard. Thank you to the friendly neighborhood for your support. You know who you are. Thank you Chris Caribou for shooting our behind the scenes footage and for helping out in general. Thank you to DZO Film for the support. Thank you to Matthias and Valentin for being our scouts. Art Temple for the VFX breakdown. Limac and Tim for the photos of the Fujinon. Thank you to Netflix, David Fincher, Eric Messerschmidt, The Smith and the whole crew behind the killer for the inspiration. And of course, thank you to our beloved members that make content like this possible. This is for you. A51 Pictures, Adrian Chapur, Ahmad Ghul, Andy Lin, C.U. Peter, Ethan Hegel, Eugenio Triana, First Surname, Gary Ferraro, H3FF01, IN53KTO, Jamie Widow, Jeff Mitchell, John Holt, Krasimir Knezevich, Lukasz Merecki, Mark Skabor, Mark Ignanovic, Marvin Finger, Maximilian Willett, Michael Heidecker, Misha Gerwich, Necron1050, Nicholas Jakubik, Nick Martin, F0 Camera, Ole Schreiter, Pascal Despois, Peter Pols, Piros Dalal, Recrawl, Rob Yale, 
Robert Hollingsworth, Robert Schriebert, RJ Permenter, Salva Sensao, Sandro Murta, Scott Hennessy, Sebastian Rooks, CY Zhu, Skinny Kid, Zoran James, Srabble, Stefan Solstrom, Steve Welsh, The Black Douglas, Tony Watimena, filmmaker, colorist, and BS. I am Nicholas, signing out with Nerdalicious Wishes. Shoot something amazing.